to Keep It Fictional podcast for book lovers, by book lovers, from the Port Moody Public Library. I am here today with my book friends, and I am so excited to talk about books today. Now, we're talking about a bit of a different kind of book today. And so all of my book friends have come in disguise. (gasps) Maybe. So today, my book friends who are going to be joining me are... Mark, Fiona, Kareen, and Virginia. Now, you might not recognize them, but maybe after we do this. Maybe not. Maybe not. (laughs) Who knows? Because a pair of glasses can sometimes mean a superhero versus not a superhero. Mm -hmm. As many of you know, in the, the situation with Clark Kent, He puts them on. He's Clark Kent. He takes them off. He is Superman. And that is all that it takes. So we are trying out today to see if by removing or putting on our glasses, we in fact become superheroes. Do we get superpowers just with the removal of our glasses? Has anybody experienced that yet by just removing their glasses today? Doesn't look like it. The fun superpower of not being able to see. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Super fuzzy now, Karine, vision. Have you, <laughs> have you found that all of your other senses have been heightened now that you can no longer see to a point of superpowers? Well, I am hungry. Okay, okay. So maybe, maybe. All right, well, as you can tell from our introduction today, we are going to be talking about books about superheroes and not just superheroes but characters who have superhuman powers so this could be an actual superhero as you see in marvel or dc this might be somebody who has a magical power you never know so we're going to see what our book friends are going to bring to us today this topic is something that i absolutely love i read many many books about people who have magical powers so it is near and dear to my heart so i'm very excited to see what all of my book friends have brought today and maybe i will add some to my reading list from what they have uh, what they're going to talk about so we're going to start today off with mark now mark what superhero and or superhero adjacent book have you brought for us today Thank you, Sadie. So the book I'll be talking about today is Wild Seed by Octavia Butler. Um, so a little bit about Octavia Butler. Like from a very young age, she was interested in being a writer. And when she went to college, it definitely was something that she was uh, studying towards becoming. And when she was in university and college, she very much became more politically involved with things like the Black Panthers, the Black Power Movement. Um, as a Black woman, this was something that resonated very strongly with her. And in her work, you can definitely see um, these kinds of issues that were raised in the 60s and 70s by these uh, movement groups as being present in her novels. Um, So definitely issues of like race, class, and gender um, play a very central role in her books. So for example, in her 1998 book, The Parable of Talents, uh, depicts the revival of a fundamentalist Christian America with a president whose actual motto was make America great again. Um, so she's definitely tapped into a lot of like things that are going on in America and the world in her novels. And that's definitely very much present in this book. But one of the things that makes her very unique is that she also writes in the genre of science fiction. Um, so she definitely brings these into a genre that at the time when she started writing was still very much dominated by white male authors. And she sort of brought like a much needed kind of alternative look at what the future and different possibilities could look like to bring a different voice to the genre um, at a time when, like, as I say, it was not entirely male, but definitely much more so than it is today. Um, It was was not the most diverse genre uh, by any stretch. Uh, She was also a very decorated writer. She was the first science fiction writer to be named a MacArthur genius. She also won the Nebula and Hugo Awards for various novels of hers. Um, But it was only in the last four or five years or so actually since her death that her books have become bestsellers. So it's definitely sort of showing that there's like a very long tail to her her work that's still resonating today. Um, And I think it's 
largely because, as I mentioned, the issues of like race, class, and gender that are very prevalent in her works that people are definitely becoming more aware of, trying to think about more, as well as to show more diversity within these kinds of genres like science fiction. So she's definitely one of the more, um, definitely a very important writer within this genre. And this particular book, Wild Seed, is actually the fourth book in her Patternist series in terms of the order that they were written in, but in terms of the chronological date of the timeline that this world takes place in, um, it's actually the first book. So it doesn't require any prior knowledge of the series, even though it's the fourth one written in it. Um, in very many ways, it could just be, it was my first introduction to the series and I didn't have any issues reading it because it doesn't assume any prior knowledge of what happens later on. It's very much an introduction to this uh, particular world. The novel incorporates a lot of accurate historical cultural and linguistic elements as it takes place in the 17th and 18th century um, in West Africa and uh, the East Coast of America. So Butler did a lot of uh, um, research to make sure it was there's accuracy to the way that the culture and the world was depicted, both the, these kind of science fiction elements that I'll talk about in just a second. So the story begins in 1690 with a man named Doro. And Doro is the head of a series of villages off the western coast of Africa and in a, uh, an English-controlled portion of America, uh, a village called Wheatley. Um, Doro has just learned that his village has been raided by slave traders from England, and he, he experiences like a feeling of loss and rage at what has just happened to his people. And along the way, as he sort of tries to head towards the English uh, slave encampment, he encounters a woman named Anyanwu, um, who is who they sort of sense each other. Like there's, the, at first we don't really know quite know what's going on with these two characters, but they sort of sense each other and sort of like drawn to each other, kind of like they have, have like extra sensory kind of perception of the other being there and they're sort of drawn towards each other. Um, and when they sort of encounter each other for the first time, they sort of know that they each have like a sort of hidden power. They can kind of sense it on each other, but they don't quite know why or what's going on with the two of them. Um, so they agree to demonstrate their powers to each other so they can sort of learn more about who the other is. And Anyanmu first demonstrates to Doro her powers by sort of, she begins rubbing her hands carefully over her body as sort of, her skin begins to move like clay and it's sort of becoming like a malleable kind of substance. And her appearance begins to change, eventually transforming her appearance into that of a man. So Anyanmu is actually a shapeshifter of sorts. She can take on the appearance of any human, regardless of race, gender, or other characteristics. She can even transform into an animal and converse with them in animal communication systems. So, for example, in the book, we see her transform into a like different animals, like a leopard and a dolphin. Um, she can also change the color of her skin from black to that of any other human she chooses. But she chooses to maintain her appearance as a black woman in her everyday life, in spite of the challenges this presents to her. Sort of as this is like as I mentioned, this is the time where slavery is just starting to become a thing. Um, she could easily try and like blend in as like a white person to try and evade these kinds of uh, practices. But she chooses to maintain her appearance as she sort of wants to be her natural self in that kind of way. But she has the special power that she can use to um, sort of deceive or like uh, get around certain things or to make herself um, to any appearance she chooses, basically. And Anyanu is actually hundreds of years old, just how old we don't quite know, but it's clear that she's able to live so long that she she doesn't seem to be a, capable of dying through natural causes. She has like this special like genes or something that we don't quite know that allows her to live for uh, many, many, many years. After explaining and demonstrating her powers to Doro, uh, Doro initially does not reciprocate in showing his powers, but instead takes Anyanwu to the lands of a rival whom he is in dispute with. Upon their arrival, Doro fights and kills the man he came to meet, and through a process that might be best described as body snatching, he transfers his consciousness into the body of the dead man, reanimated once again as though he had not died. Um, so Doro, it seems, is able to continue his life indefinitely, uh, so long as he finds a fresh body to inhabit that is not infirm or dying of natural causes. So Doro also has this special ability that allows him to live for many, many, many generations, perhaps even indefinitely, so long as he's able to find a body that he can inhabit and has not killed himself. Allowing him so essentially he can sort of... Um, move from body to body through his special abilities. So in that way, our two protagonists are able to take on potentially innumerable appearances and represent two different possibilities or directions of human capabilities 
that are sort of explored throughout this series because the power in this series very much is about these kinds of super humans that have sort of, be, sort of started to emerge out of seemingly nowhere. They represent different possibilities for human evolution, human change, and human abilities. As Anyanyu represents an ability to heal, mend, transform, and slow the effects of aging and illness, whereas Dora was much more a sort of powerful, mighty, like warrior kind of person who is able to take life rather than give it, as he sort of takes a much more kind of uh, patriarchal kind of authority power stance within the series, whereas Anyanyu was much more like a caring, nurturing, sort of moralistic figure. So they kind of have these two sides of the same coin in a certain way, where they are opposites of one another in these different ways. Um, and essentially, Dora was interested in Anyanwu, and he sort of invites her to join him in his village in uh, America, because uh, he's Dora, as I mentioned, he's sort of like leading these different villages and different areas of the world. And Dora has a sort of goal to bring together these different people into his uh, sort of settlements in order to try and bring about a change in human evolution. He sort of believes in the ability to sort of direct the future changes in human abilities and human life by bringing together these kinds of people. Um, Anyanwu is very much kind of disgusted by this idea. She's very much against it. Um, but sort of Doro sort of makes a deal with her because recently Anyanwu's uh, village had also been raided by slave traders and Doro agrees to free them if Anyanwu agrees to come with him to America with her. So they kind of make this um, this deal with each other to um, to go along with each other as long as it's sort of is mutually beneficial to the two of them in different ways. Um, throughout this book, we also encounter other individuals with special abilities, such as Lael Sachs, who has the ability to telepathically send vivid thoughts and visions into the minds of others. Um, there's also Isaac, Doro's own son who can telepathically lift objects and move them with his mind, the kind of power and force that exceeds the normal limits of a human being. Um, sort of after moving to America, Anyanwu sort of settles down with Isaac and starts a family. They sort of um, become uh, settled in this area for many, many years. And there's a sort of later time skip ahead in the book of about 50 years, much later on, um, after several events have occurred. And it's in 1741 that there's um, it's kind of split between Anyanyu and Doro that I don't want to go into too much, but just is, without giving too much away, the, the series is several books long, so the exact saga of Anyanyu and Doro isn't really settled once and for all in this one particular book. It continues on throughout the generations, through many centuries, and even millennia into the future. Um, and it's, it's sort of the name of the book comes from the book title Wild Seed comes from this idea that um, this is a name that Doro gives to Anyanwu because unlike many other people who are in Doro's village, Anyanwu doesn't sort of meekly go along with Doro's plans for the future and things like that. I uh, sort of refers to as wild seed in this way, wild meaning that she's wild and uncontrollable and seed kind of like the idea of future, like planting a seed for the future of humanity kind of um, and essentially, this will play a much bigger role later on in the future books in the series that I don't want to go to, that I don't exactly know about, but just leads to say it's going to continue on for much longer. Um, and this kind of two sided relationship between the two different ideas of what's right and wrong, power versus like caring, like patriarchal versus matriarchal kind of authority, different ways of seeing how humanity can develop, the, the different visions for caring versus killing and things like that. Um, it definitely explores these kinds of ideas throughout this kind of science fictional scenario um, across different generations. So if you like sci-fi with lots of interpersonal relationships and tensions, or think the idea of a historical based narrative with sci-fi element sounds cool, or interested in stories with lots of social and political relevance, then you may also like Wild Seed by Octavia Butler. Wonderful, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, Octavia Butler is an author who has been on my to-be-read list for a very long time, and I actually have not 
ever read one of her books, but uh, she is definitely a powerhouse in the science fiction genre. So if you love science fiction, if you love fantasy, um, as Mark said, all those other wonderful themes that are in her books, um, I highly recommend checking out uh, Wild Seed as Mark recommended and any of her other books. Wonderful. All right. Well, our next book friend that is going to tell us about uh, their book is Fiona today. Fiona, what superhero magic book did you bring for us today? Uh, I actually found a delightful YA that I enjoyed very much. Uh, and I'm quite glad because I am exhausted with superheroes. <laughs> uh, uh, people say like, oh, did you do this? Did you watch the superhero thing or whatever? And I'm just like, brain off uh so it was i was dreading this a little bit and i'm so happy uh because i really really found uh, a great book that is also a series that i'm going to continue to read so uh what i read was faith taking flight by julie murphy uh and many of you know that i am a huge julie murphy fan uh and this book continues to um assert that she can do no wrong <laughs> just Everything she does is like delightful, you know, and and wherever she's taking it, um, it it maintains her kind of like signature um, themes and and delightful, understated uh, kind of like narrative and character um, building that is just like so delightful. So Faith is actually a character from an existing uh, superhero comic called Harbinger which is um, published by Valiant Comics. Um, as far as I know, there are no other um, book tie-ins like to other characters or anything. So I'm not sure how it came about. You know, maybe it was just somebody um, that the, the, the author was excited to write about. Um, and that was kind of cool because I've, I don't know Valiant Comics. I'd never heard of Harbinger. Um, but don't let that scare you away from the book. You do not need any of that information. But it did kind of put me in the door of like, Maybe I'll go check this out. Maybe I'll go find out what this is about. So Faith is a regular small town high school student. Uh, and she is a, a big nerd. Um, she is very uh, invested in fandom, uh, especially for the show The Grove, which has been ongoing uh, for for decades Uh even when her her parents were um, younger, they were watching it, and it's sort of like, um, oh, what's that Canadian uh, high school? Um, yeah, with Drake, it's like it's it's like Degrassi meets superheroes uh, is what the idea of this like fictional show, and she's obsessed with it. She runs this blog um, about uh, about the show and all these like predictions, and she has a lot of like online. Uh, fame from that blog that she runs and it's really important to her because like I said her parents were also fans um, and her parents uh, she lost them both in a car accident uh, kind of a a little bit of a like classic uh, superhero um, experience it seems um, so um, the superhero part comes in not just from the show uh, but when Faith is uh, recruited um, through this online um, massive multiplayer RPG to like meet this group uh, at the mall. When she gets there, uh, it's just one guy. It's just one older guy. Very creepy. And I was a little bit like, oh, it's going. It's sinister, but uh, not in the Degrassi way. Um, so uh, he actually is like, you know, Faith, I think you're pretty special, like maybe really special. And she's like, oh, my gosh, all my dreams, all my nerdy dreams are coming true. I'm a special person. And he's like, I think you might be a Psyot. Um, so Psyot is the word they use for superheroes. And uh, he takes her to uh, this like kind of like underground facility uh, called the Harbinger facility. Yeah. And, and she's sort of like, oh, I shouldn't do this, but I might be special. Um, and uh, they tell her grandma that she's going to this um, journalism camp. And while she is there, she pretty much gets like thrown in a cell and it's quite clear that she's going to be an experiment. Um, and then uh, they let her know that they're going to try to activate uh, this uh, this Psyot um, DNA and she might become a superhero or she might die. 
doesn't really matter now because she doesn't have a choice in the matter. It's all being forced on her. So um, she does get some superhero powers from this and she escapes the facility and she goes back to her um, everyday teenager life. Uh, and this is kind of what I really love about this. Uh, it's it's so understated. Like, it's very much just a delightful, small-town, fat kid, Julie Murphy, YA. And just a note on fat politics, because it's going to come up here a lot. This is Julie Murphy's thing, um, and I love her for it. She writes amazing characters, and they are fat. And for those of you who are not sort of um, in... Uh, on board with the fat politics. It's just this idea that uh, a person, or in this case, a character, uh, can be fat, and they can also uh, be treated with respect, uh, and they can also have an entire whole personality. Um, and and as people, and as readers in this case, we can respect that. Uh, it shouldn't be revolutionary, but, uh, you know, from like a publishing standpoint, we do not get to see that a lot in characters. And Julie Murphy uh, pushes this and I love her for it so much. And I think that's why this is not just a fun superhero book, but an awesome superhero book because it's this fun everyday high school student. Um, but she when do you get to see a fat superhero? When do you get to to be strong and and special as well as being fat so um yeah that's definitely something like i think you can read it and and ignore all of that stuff but it also might bring readers who who want to see that represent representation um so we are there she's got the power she goes back to her regular life and but she's got the secret uh and she's also got this trauma but she's like this delightful um like just just a uh, happy uh, kid who wants to do good, who loves animals, who thinks she might want to be a vet, who has best friends who have like sort of everyday problems. Um, and, and wow, I've talked a lot, but I still haven't like told you all the things that I love about it of, of like, you know, she's got these two great friends who are having their own problems. Then this like show that she loves, The Grove, relocates to her hometown. She has this like romance, this um, with the woman who is the star of the show that she totally loves. Um, and will also kind of have like a little bit of a love triangle because she also has an interest in one of the guys that she works at the paper with. Um, and there is a uh, corn maze. There are missing animals. Uh, there is all these sort of like delightful, um, I guess, like, you know, what when you're like, OK, we want to have like a little bit of a mystery, but it can't be too scary. So we're going to use these sort of like the animals are missing, um, like <laughs> sort of thing. And she kind of sleuths a little bit. But, you know, she acknowledges that she's not a really great sleuth. So um. All of this is sort of happening while we're wondering, like, what about the superpower, Faith? Tell us more about the superpower. And every once in a while, she's like, I'm going to fly, but just a little bit so that nobody sees. Um, and we're kind of waiting for that shoe to drop. And it does at the end, um, like, it's very much going towards a, um, like, X-Men vibe of, like, these um, handful, of handful of misfits um, who are probably going to come together. But... Um, I just I loved how understated it was. I loved that we didn't jump into that. We got to know Faith so well. And she is honestly just like such a delightful character. I'm going to pick up the next one because I want to read more about Faith. I don't really care so much about this other like harbinger thing that is going on. Um, yeah, it's all about it's all about me for her. No, her for me. <laughs> so um, if you love Julie Murphy, uh, I'd say don't be afraid by the uh fact that it's about superheroes um if you're like if you're into superheroes and it's more like um the unbeatable squirrel girl is like a little bit more where you're at with the like sort of fun stuff um i, I it very much has that like that like lighter tone um well there's still some serious stuff going on um and it really won me over because it has my permission to like to like go into a whole series thing where I'm going to get invested, um, you know, despite despite the the hero hero superhero exhaustion that I was feeling before this book. Uh, so that is Faith Taking Flight. And one more note, which is that um, the audiobook is really great. It's a single narrative um, and the uh, 
voice actor um, gets the character like down pat. I think that's part of what made her so lovable for me. That's so wonderful. Thank you so much, Fiona. That sounds like just a really fun, <laughs> fun is is the word that comes to mind. Um, and that, yeah, thank you for for talking about that book. I I think I'm going to definitely add that one to my to be read list. So that's wonderful. And I, I can understand the superhero exhaustion. I think that uh, at all avenues, we are being thrown superheroes into our face in TV and movies and books and video games and in everything. I think superheroes are there. So uh, I can understand that wanting to distance ourselves a little bit. Um, okay, so I am actually going to talk about my book next, which is not so much superheroes as not surprisingly focuses more on magic. Um, I, I know it's a shocker. It is a big, big shocker. <laughs> Um, so the book that I'm going to be talking about is called Her Majesty's Royal Coven. It's by Juno Dawson. Uh, Juno Dawson is a British author, and um, she's most commonly known for um, one of her more popular titles is This Book is Gay, um, which is one of the most banned books um, in the last few years, which is often means it's going to be a good read. I think that uh, uh, not always, but I think that often uh, means that we should go out and try and read it. Um, I haven't read that one, but uh, after reading this book, I think I will search out more of uh, Juno Dawson's books. Um, uh, Juno Dawson it came out as a transgender woman in 2015. And so many of her books have um, themes of LGBTQ plus um, characters and transgender characters in them. Um, and this uh, Her Majesty's Royal Coven does as well. Um, so Her Majesty's Royal Coven revolves around uh, five friends, and we start our story when they are in their um, adolescence, and it takes place in the 90s. Um, one reason why I connected with them, I think, is because they're they were growing up at the same time that I was. Um, and so it uh, takes place in the nineties and they always talked about which Spice Girls care or which Spice Girls they were going to be. And just kind of that big nineties vibe. Um, but there's something different about uh, these five girls. Um, they are all part of magical families. And um, on the night of uh, before the uh, summer solstice, they are gathering in their treehouse. Um, they're all a little bit nervous because the next day they are going to pledge their oaths to Her Majesty's Royal Coven. And Her Majesty's Royal Coven is a, for lack of a better term, government agency um, that was started uh, by Queen Elizabeth I. And it is uh, designed for witches to work for the government on behalf of the government uh, to put their life to good use and be a good, proper citizen uh, using their magic to protect the people of Britain. Um, so it's a top secret agency, of course, as it has to be, because magic is not known throughout the whole world. Um, but these five girls are finally going to be able to join this agency. Um, we have Helena, who is uh, very, very old lines of magic in her family. Elle, who um, is friends with all of these girls, has been for years, doesn't know she quite fits in. Um, Leone knows that she definitely doesn't fit in. She's mixed race. Uh, she's a lesbian. She does not connect with these women and these girls um, on any level that she finds. She is always told that she has to be Scary Spice um, because of uh, her mixed race background, and she is not happy about that. Um, and then we have twins. We have Niam and Sierra, uh, the Irish twins. So we see these girls right before they're about to pledge their lives and learn about their magic. We then jump forward 25 years, and a lot has happened um, in that 25 years. And the group has kind of split up. Um, there was a civil war a few years before where a warlock decided that because they have magical powers, why are they in the shadows? Why are they the ones who are hiding when they can control anyone in the world who does not? So they decide that that's what they're going to do. Um, obviously, one side of the uh, faction does not agree with that, and so it breaks out into civil war. Uh, there is much tragedy. Um, many of our main protagonists lose spouses, lose friends, lose family in this war. And we are now in the aftermath of this. Warlocks are not as trusted as they used to be, even though it was not just, it wasn't all warlocks, it was just one. 
um, but they're still not trusted as usual. Helena has now become the head of Her Majesty's Royal Coven, the youngest ever head of the Royal Coven. Leone has branched off. She has decided that she no longer wants to be a part, and she has started her own coven called Diaspora, which um, tries to be more inclusive and more diverse. Um, Niam has decided that she also does not want to be part of the coven. She's a vet and she loves her work with animals. She still uses her gift to help and ease deaths of animals as um, as they're at the end of their life. Um, Elle has decided that she just wants to be a housewife. She is happy in her middle-class life, um, staying away from magic and the coven. And lastly, Sierra. Sierra was the one of them that decided to join in the Civil War on the opposite side. And in the aftermath of the Civil War, we learn as we read through this book, there was something that happened and Sierra is unresponsive in a coma and has been since the end of this Civil War. Now, the, Her Majesty's Royal Coven has seers at their, uh, at their hands that they can use that are going to predict all these big events that are going to happen. And one of these big events is the rise of something called the Sullied Child. And the Sully child is somebody who, yes, it's the word choice is is very uh, triggering. I think for some people, it's very it kind of evokes uh, quite a not a good not a good um, image. Uh, but the Sully child is uh, somebody who is going to come and destroy Her Majesty's royal coven and destroy the world. And the Sully child is going to be a warlock, so it's going to be a male witch. And uh, the seers have started to see images of this child more often. And so one day they find a young warlock up in Scotland who has completely destroyed his school. They take him into custody. He is put into a jail cell and they think that they have found the Sully child. No matter what they do, he will not stop destroying things. So Helena, at her wit's end, brings in Niam, who is called an adept, which means that she has multiple different powers. Um, and she thinks that maybe Niam will be able to get through to this, this teen and at least get him to stop destroying everything in his path. So when Niam comes in, she tries to read his mind to see kind of what's going on in there. And she she comes across a block. She comes across a block, but realizes that being in a cell is not going to help him in any way. And so she decides that she's going to take him into her house and teach him um, and try and get through to him that way. So with Helena's kind of approval, um, she decides to take uh, this young warlock, Theo, into her house and try to learn a bit more about him to try and figure out um, if he is, in fact, this child that everyone is talking about. But when she brings him home, she starts to learn a little bit more. She starts to get a little bit more information. He starts to loosen up a little bit more. And she learns that the one major thing that is blocking the use of magic and making all of this destruction is the fact that he is not a male. The female. He's a, he's a girl. And because she doesn't feel like she can truly be herself, she has this block in her magic. And so she's lashing out with all of this destruction because she's not being true to herself. Um, Niam views this without Theo's knowledge. And so she doesn't want to let Theo know that she knows this about her because it's in her mind a huge breach of privacy and not something that she should have seen that she should know but she does everything that she can to let Theo know that she can be whoever she wants and Naim is going to be there to support her so Theo eventually tells Naim that she is transgender that she has always been a girl has always felt not right in her body. Niam welcomes her and says, of course, you are a witch. You are part of our coven. You will always be part of our coven. This is not the way that everybody feels in the coven. Helena, more specifically, um, does not agree with this. 
She sees Theo as a warlock and always will. And no warlock in her mind should have as much power as Theo does. So Helena decides to try and take Theo away from Niam and give her back to the warlocks. Um, this spurs on a huge disagreement and eventually a huge war between these factions, between the covens, and between this group of friends. Um, this book was a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't know too much about it when I first started reading it, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it definitely deals with some themes that are that could be really difficult for some people um, to read. It could be very triggering. There's a lot of transphobia um, in this book from, from one side. There's also a lot of acceptance in this book from, from the other side of characters. Um, so you do see both both sides of that, um, but it could be difficult to read um, some of the, the transphobic things that are said um, about Theo and to Theo. Um, and so I will just warn people about that. Um, but it is a really great book with really strong characters and really strong connections. Um, it has lots of action. You find yourself loving some characters, absolutely hating some other characters. Um, it ends with a huge twist and a huge cliffhanger. Um, the next book is not scheduled to come out, I think, until this year, I think, hopefully. Um, so I've been waiting for that um, because I'm not exactly sure if, uh, yeah, how how Dawson is going to get her characters out of the mess that she has put them in. So I'm very curious, uh, curious to see how that happens. Um, so yeah, so that is Her Majesty's Royal Coven by Juno Dawson. All right. Well, I think that it is time for our existential question of the day. And the question that I have for all of my book friends is, do you find it easy to suspend your disbelief when you are reading about characters who have superpowers or who have magic. And then a follow-up to that is, is there anything that you are not able to suspend your disbelief for? Is there anything that you read that is you find just too unbelievable and you just cannot, cannot read it? Uh, let's start with Virginia on this one. Virginia, what do you think? I am in for anything. I have no, I have no issues with you know, like whatever wild thing you throw at me, I will, I will go with it. Um, I think the only thing that I cannot stand is unreasonable, illogical human behavior. So nothing to do with magic, nothing to do with superpowers. I'm totally okay with that. But when it is people behaving in a weird, unbe like just ways that just doesn't make sense to me, that's when I have a problem with it. So that's fair. That's fair. I can understand that. That doesn't surprise me. I, I figured you would be, you would be someone who would be similar to me and could read pretty much uh, anything on the magic and and superhero side of things. Um, I will say for myself that I struggle. There's a uh, a theme mainly in YA fantasy I find lately um, that follows characters that are angels, which I find a bit odd. Um, and that is one thing that I have struggled to fully kind of get behind is angel characters and giving like personalities and I don't know it just seems like a very strange thing and then sometimes I, I struggle to read about the fae as well which uh, is a theme that has been in, in fantasy for a very long time it just it just sometimes gets a bit too over the top but uh Corrine what about you oh I have opinions <laughs> So many. Um, strangely enough, I tend to put magic and super pure uh, super powers in different categories. I tend to think of them as two different genres. Um, I don't mind magic if there's like a magic system to go along with it. If there's like a reason for the magic, that's fine. Superpowers, I think, are stupid. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't like them. I don't like them. I don't like superhero movies. The words that I say probably the most often is nobody cares about Ant-Man. Um, so yeah, uh, can I suspend my disbelief? Like, if I have to, if I have to, but I don't feel like I should. Um, the one that I hate the most is super strength. I think it's just the worst. 
it's just the, I don't I don't I, I'm sorry I thought the Incredibles movie is overrated I'm just gonna tap myself out right now bold claims from Kareem bold claims we might uh to see if we get any angry messages about uh, the Incredibles uh, with that one. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> All right. What about you, Mark? Do you uh, suspend your disbelief easily? Well, I think there just has to be some sort of explanation or structure to why things happen. So as long as there's like a, a convincing or clear reason why there's this sort of like structure to things within this universe, then typically I can kind of go with it. Um, the only time I really get an issue is that they make someone that's like way stronger way more powerful than the other people like there's this one like exceptional person like it just feels doesn't feel interesting at that point because there's just the one person who can do everything or they can just like win any fight immediately and things like that it's like that's just the biggest issue for me i think like you have to have like sort of even like somewhat even at least like or have like one side if one side's way stronger than the other or like one side always wins there's like just doesn't really feel very interesting at that point, I think. That's fair. That's fair. I can understand that. All right, Fiona, what about you? I often really struggle to suspend disbelief. And I think it's like, it's a big block in my reading of like, a, uh, if I like if I wasn't so judgmental, I think I could enjoy things more. And that's why I do love like an, an author who can lull me into like something that's really out there and just writes in a like in a self-aware way and and a way that uses might use like something like a superpower as a literary device, like either to explore character or to explore society or whatever like like I like that like I'm making a choice um that really helps me a lot but I do love like when somebody can convince me something crazy and then I can just have fun like that's such a nice thing to just be able to be like oh like I don't have to judge this I just can can go with it yeah and for me other things that um I can't get on board are just like things that socially don't make sense I really I and and I think I've mentioned before like sometimes wish fulfillment for me is a big like just a big no because I just I want I need things to be grounded and like so sometimes if it's not justified even if it's like a fantasy world where they're creating a new society I like I need things to be justified without um without them being ex uh ex like over explained which is like really hard that's a lot to ask <laughs> that makes sense though I get that wishes are weird wishes are very strange <laughs> make you spill water everywhere <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to all of my book friends for weighing in on our question today. All right. Kareen, what superhero superpower book did you bring for us? Well, well, well. So this was a topic that I, so as, a, as no surprise to uh, considering my previous comments, had a really hard time finding a book. Um, and usually when I have a hard time finding a book to fit the brief, it ends up being about math. I don't know why. I don't know how. Um, but no matter what the topic is and I don't like it, it ends up having to be about math. And honestly, my biggest critique of this book on top of a, a number of other things is could have used more math. <laughs> um, which is not a statement that I, of all people, thought I would be saying, but here we are. Um, so our main character is Kaz, uh, Kaz, 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 something cool. It's definitely pronounced in a cool way that I'm not really wrapping my tongue around, who is described as the side cover, which I didn't read, which I really should have, as Love Trinity in the Matrix, meet Kaz Russell. Oof. Um, anyways, she's a mathlete, um, but not the mathlete like you're thinking. She is athletic and can punch people and do all the kicky things, but she's also good at math, really good at math, like scary good at math. If someone has a, a gun trained on her, then she can calculate the, oh boy, trajectories and velocity. 
uh, and get all the angles so that she knows uh, exactly when to kind of like dodge out of the way of the bullet. Um, she does all of the Matrix style things that you would expect because her math is just that good. So good is her math that no window stands in her way and she can leap out of a two story building and land perfectly because she, she can math it. This is not going to be good. All right. So she has been hired by Donna Polk to track down her sister, Courtney, who accidentally became a drug smuggler and then accidentally betrayed the cartels and then accidentally got herself kidnapped by the cartels and shipped off to Columbia, as you do. As you do. So um, Donna, who is an office worker, um, hires Cass, Cass, Trinity from The Matrix, um, to rescue her sister because she's heard she's really good at it and like so she is when you're this good at math nothing can stand you in your way um not even an awkward encounter with your i'm gonna go with friend uh rio who is an unstoppable psychopath who's working as an undercover something for the cartels and when you're caught he has to kind of like punch you but it's fine because like you can math exactly when to turn your face away and he'll just split your lip and it's fine it's fine the math takes care of it. Um, so, of course, she manages to kill all the bad guys um, quite easily using the power of addition and subtraction and takes Courtney back to L.A. where Courtney tearfully hires Cass, Cass um, to kind of like get her life back together. Courtney seems to recognize, oh, you're really good at math and you're really good at figuring things out. So just like math my life back to normal. And reluctantly, because she has apparently nothing else to do, she, she agrees. Um, but, but as she's trying to gather the pieces of this woman's life together, that's when everything falls apart. Uh, so when she goes to Courtney's apartment to get her money that she's hidden under the floorboards, we just don't do floorboards anymore like we used to it's a real shame it's a real shame um she finds that there are these like shadowy agents dressed all in black that have staked out her house um when she goes to get some intel from her favorite hacker and his uh perky little 12 year old daughter they're immediately firebombed and die in horrible inferno <laughs> oops um she does uh she also gets attacked by a motorcycle gang, but is kind of saved, but not saved because she's too cool to be saved um, by author trusting. And if you think that sounds like trusting, you would be correct. Um, he is a PI who ha has been hired by a woman whose husband um, committed suicide, but she doesn't think it was suicide. She thinks that he was tricked into it or that it was murder. And as he has been investigating this case, he has... Uh, kind of recognize some odd coincidences or strange occurrences that are happening that he ties to this um, deeply shadowy organization called Pithica, which undeniably is a really cool name for like a bag company. Um, like, oh, did you get the new Pithica release bag? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, but anyways, it's a shadowy organization and it seems to be able to convince people to do things that they wouldn't normally do, i.e. write grammatical errors in their suicide notes, uh, quit their jobs or go to Colombia and rescue a supposed drug runner. Uh, da, da, da. So who is manipulating who and why? Is Kaz slash Cass the only person with magical powers? And as her and her best friend Rio, the unstoppable psychopath, and Arthur are drawn further into the conspiracy, they uh, Cass slash Cass discovers that it might have something to do with her own shadowy and forbidden past that she doesn't remember because of course she doesn't. Yeah. So it could have used more math. Um, yeah, for someone who has like math as a superpower, I would have expected a more mathematical based approach to anything. Um, it's really tough because I think sometimes when you try to make like a really hardcore fighty hero, um, you sometimes forget to make them like a character um and they are just like a set of skills and especially because you know they're trying to be like really like grim dark about it um they don't care about anyone and then you don't care about them 
uh, which is a problem. And then I think it's something that Mark actually alluded to is that if someone has all the powers in the world and they're like unstoppable and unbeatable, um, then it makes it really uninteresting because you also have to have a villain who's equally as unstoppable and unbeatable and unhittable. It's kind of like in the Fast and the Furious movies, how you have Vin Diesel and you have The Rock and contractually Vin Diesel is never allowed to lose a fight. So uh, allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly in his contract, he's not allowed to lose any fight. So whenever there's like a battle or there's like two people going against each other, no one can win and no one can lose. Everyone just kind of like walks away with a like, next time. <laughs> um, so in that way, I that that is my problem with the superhero genre is that no one can win, no one can lose. And so it's ultimately feels pointless. Like n- none of you, there's not going to be a resolution to this that's satisfying until the very end where you're going to triumph over some way. And if you're going to triumph, it has to be very interesting, interesting of how you do that. Like, how do you beat someone who's for all intents and purposes, or all intents and purposes, unbeatable? Their powers make them an unstoppable force. And so I I feel like that's a real problem of this genre that, you know, a a genre that is full of tropes that in order to subvert it, you have to be so clever and try something so new. And I don't necessarily think that this book achieves that. Um, It is the first book and there's a sequel. um, So maybe, maybe she does. But at the end, I was left kind of like, oh, well, nothing has change um and the other thing i don't love about the genre is the uh body count um where there's just like indiscriminate killing of innocence all the time oh i showed up and i killed like 17 dudes and you're like oh, well there were people t- they were people too like they, they, we, we could shed a tear for the loss of human life like some of them I, one of our main characters that were I think supposed to care about kills an entire horribly murders an entire office of people um in visceral detail and we're just supposed to be like well that's the price we pay for powers or something and I, I that is that is for me like a real turnoff as a reader and that's why I don't like zombie movies is that it makes human life so cheap when you do that when you're killing off henchmen or you're killing off bad guys there's no meaning to any of it and it just kind of it, it cheapens what a human life is and this has turned into my mini rant against superhero movies so I'm going to wrap it up by saying if you're looking for uh if you really enjoyed trinity in the matrix movies uh, you will probably enjoy Zero Sum Game by S.L. Huang. Or not. I feel like this is how we got 10 Fast and the Furious movies. Because nobody ever wins. I And this coming from someone who has only watched ever one Fast and the Furious movie. So I can't speak too much about it. But uh... are you kidding? They're cinematic masterpieces. One through seven are <laughs> pretty much the greatest movies ever made. Okay. Is the 10th one called Fast? Then your seatbelts, like fast ten, your seatbelts. It is not. 10. Oh, they missed out. Come on. All right. Well, thank you, <laughs> Thank you for uh, that very honest math-based review of um, of that book. Uh, who knew? Who knew that math? There could be else too much math and also not enough math. Yeah, very green new. Green new. <laughs> All right. For our final book talk today, we have Virginia. What superhero magic based book did you bring for us? I didn't realize there's going to be so much hatred for everything here. Um, I yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't care for superhero movies either. But I don't hate them. I don't think the way it's been expressed today. So it's eye opening for me today. Anyway, um, I think one of the things that I can. I think we can all agree that we don't hate is that there are amazing authors out there, and many of them have a bit more clout with us than others. Um, if they like a book, we often say, "Oh, we're going to read it." You know, we will put it on our TBR because they like it and because we respect them. And so when it comes to my favorite genres, when it comes to books that really center on the experience of the LGBTQ community, I always turn to Charlie Jane Anders. She's a big advocate for books and authors. And I 
just if she recommends it, I know it's going to be good. And so this is a book that I found because she gave five stars on Goodreads. Um, and it is Dreadnought by April Daniels. So this is a young adult series um, and it is book one of the Nemesis series and book two Sovereign is also out. So you can find those two near your in a library near you. Um, so Dreadnought is the superhero origin story of Danielle Danny Tosa. And she got her superpowers at the shopping mall. Um, is she was there one day to go grab some nail polish and um, once she grabbed what she wants she immediately went out to the parking lot behind the mall kicked off her shoes and started painting her toes because painting her nails is something that really helps her calm down it helps her center herself whenever she feels like she's not quite herself whenever she doesn't feel right that's what she does to make her feel better better. So she was happily painting her toes away when a giant thing fell from the sky and landed not too far from Danny. And when the dust settles, she realizes it is not a thing. It is Dreadnought, one of the most powerful superheroes in her city. And if you hate super strength, Corrine, then you will hate Dreadnought because that's what she he has, among other things. Anyway, Dreadnought is not looking so powerful right now because not only is he severely injured from whatever that slams him to the ground, but he also has a giant hole in his chest. It's not looking good. And if there is something that can do that to Dreadnought, the nearly invincible superhero, then Danny should really run far, far away. But she couldn't because there's a guy dying right in front of her she just she can't just leave him there so she decides to sort of drag him to a bit more of a shelter at least just so that she, he's not so out in the open and she tries to give him some water because that's kind of what you do when you see somebody injured even though it's not going to help him at all but Shrednaw started saying to her about like something about utopia some you know like and and some somehow she's got this new weapon and then he has never heard of utopia but she assumes that it must be whoever that did this to dreadnought and then Dreni and then dreadnought turned to danny and said you know you are so young i am so sorry to do this to you but i'm dying as you can see and i can't let my powers die with me so here i'm gonna give you my power sorry kid i know this is a lot and with that, Dreadnought reaches into his chest and takes out this white ball of light and it holds it out for Danny and she touches it and then there's light everywhere and there's pain and everything feels twisted. The universe feels like it's unraveling. And when everything stops, everything hurts and she is lying on the ground with Dreadnought now dead. She starts yelling his name to try to wake him up. But what comes out of her surprise and shock her because it was a girl's voice. And she looked down and she said, oh my gosh, my body has changed. I have now changed into a girl. And all her life, that's what Danny has always wished for. She always know that she is not a boy. She's born, born into the wrong body. She is a girl. And now the world will also know but what will the world think of it? This is a book about Danny, of course, figuring out the powers that she has acquired, along with a newish superhero, Calamity, who dresses as a cowgirl um, that Danny met. And uh, later find out that, you know, Calamity also goes to her school. Um, and a little bit different from Fiona's book, there's definitely a lot of superhero stuff in here. If you like the superhero things, you're going to have a very satisfying read. Um, Danny's trying to test out her powers and she can fly. She has superhuman strength, like I mentioned. But she also has this ability to perceive reality in a different way, um, which makes it pretty cool. So, you know, like, I'll let you discover that. And... Um, April, April Daniels did a really good job in describing those scenes. And sometimes when we think about superheroes, we think about like a graphic novel or like maybe on screen that you can see those action. But she did it just with words and you can picture the scenes perfectly. So she did a really good job in that. There's also a little reference and calling out Batman for his superpower of being very rich. That's pretty much all he got. So that was kind of funny. Um, and then, you know, Danny, of course, also has to learn what it means to be a superhero. Like what kind of superhero 
do I want to be? And, you know, in the world where, you know, like she's got, like, she's supposed to be Dreadnought and, and Dreadnought belongs to the Legion. And, you know, when the Legion discovers that Danny has Dreadnought's powers, you know, they're trying to like tell her like, okay, well, you know, like you can't go caping yet. That's what they call it because you're too young, you know, and there's all these, you know, and, and they have bad experience with, with superheroes being too young and not being able to adjust to their power. So they're trying to be careful. But, you know, Danny, of course, has to figure out a different way of doing things. You know, what is right, you know, like is for her might be different from what other people think. Um, but wrestling with her superpowers, that is definitely not you know, like Danny's biggest challenge because this is also a coming out story for Danny. And sort of like uh, Sadie's book, there is a lot of transphobia and misgendering and homophobia that Danny has to deal with when she came out to the world. And the world is not really accepting her. Um, you know, and that is probably like I think, you know, it's not really dealing with Utopia or other the supervillains that that is the, the hardest for, for her. Her family, for example, you know, like her dad especially, things that this is just a temporary thing, like, you know, that it could be fixed. Like, it, they just have to find the right doctors. Um, and, you know, like, they wanted this son that they had. And even if Danny keep telling them that, like, I was never your son. I have always been your daughter. Like, they would not listen. She also lost her best friend because of that when she came out. You know, like, again, people won't accept her. Even the superheroes, even the Legion, who, you know, like, who is supposed to be the good guy, so to speak. She's getting some very turfy treatment from some of them. And because no one will call them out, she also feels like, well, do I want to like stay with you, the Legion, because you won't even stand up for me. So she feels like she can't really trust them either. So, you know, Danny has to learn sort of on her own how to deal with all the changes and all the power that she has. And, and it made her doubt herself even more because like already she's kind of thinking, well, it's not like Dread not pick me like for my qualities or for my potential. I just happen to be there. And so how can I talk about defending the city? How can I protect people if I can't even like stand up to my dad? So she feels like very much like she's not worthy of the power. But then you will soon come to realize that, you know, being true to yourself, fighting for what, you know, what, you know, you who you are is not selfish. That's what everybody wants to tell her. But she have to learn that that is not the case. And, you know, as kind of Fiona said, the world needs superheroes of all kinds and superhero stories of all kinds. And April Daniels has given us a transgender superhero to cheer for. And a superhero, I think, not just having those like superpowers that, you know, we talk about, but also there are many, many facets to her. And she's not she's not feeling the, the super strength that she has because of all these other challenges that she has. Um, so, yeah, so look for Danny in Dreadnought and in also the sequel. The book, um, the first book definitely has a lot of potential for a sequel so can't wait to see what uh danny does next so this is dreadnought by april daniels wonderful thank you virginia that uh that is another one i think that i'm going to put on my tbr in our list so that's wonderful i got a couple new books today so thank you so much to all of my book friends uh for bringing your recommendations or not recommendations uh to today's episode <laughs> hey if you like math a little bit, but not too much. That might be the one for you. You never know. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much to all of our listeners and our viewers today. Uh, once again, we are Keep It Fictional from the Port Moody Public Library, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.